it's Lee from ColoringQueen.net and I hope you're doing well today. I have got a printed page today from Carolina Kubikarska. It's of bunnies and it's for my animals in August. Color along. Yes, I'm late. We all know that. And I got the picture from her Etsy store and I had it printed on A5 express blender card i'm going to use my copic markers and some pencils maybe a bit of posca and uh, color this little postcard size picture in uh, i'll probably do some offline as well so i hope that you have been having a really good week um, i've had a, a fattening week <laughs> i've been doing a lot of uh, cooking made up a huge lasagna I think it was yesterday or no maybe the day before they all blend in together and anyway it's so much I've had to put half of it in the freezer but you know it tastes delicious which is unfortunate because I've had to, <laughs> had two pieces of it already <laughs> and I also uh, you know made something sweet I've discovered this brand you know that's really good for the old diabetes uh, it's called No Shoe if you're in Australia and so I made up some sugar-free chocolate cupcakes and they are delicious. They don't have sugar in them, they've got that artificial sweetness stuff. But um, yeah, so they have been delicious and uh, lots of cupcakes, so many cupcakes that I ice them up and I put half of them in the freezer. But they're all pretty tempting. I've got to keep David away from them though because he can have sugar and he keeps eating all my cupcakes. But that's okay, I'll just make some more. <laughs> but um, if you hear some noise in the background, Buddy is having a big old scratch. He's going to get groomed uh, tomorrow and uh, yeah get a nice shampoo blow dry bit of cutting and whatnot so he's going for that tomorrow but he's been rolling in the cut grass and uh, he's got the old itches happening and uh, some other noise in the background might be Billy the little dog that I mind um, she's seen someone over the road that she loves and she's sort of whining a little bit at the door so uh, excuse the dogs Millie of course is not here she's having a rest and when Billy comes over to be minded she bags as her little snuggle basket and uh, because Billy likes to sleep in it as well because Billy's um, toy size she's only tiny she's really really tiny and she loves Millie's snuggle basket and Millie is not having it because she loves that basket it's all hers and she's not going to share it or anything like that <laughs> so what else have uh, we been doing here buddy unfortunately he's had a really rough uh, last week he's uh, unfortunately had uh, a few seizures on last Monday now so virtually a week ago and he had three in a day which is a cluster so we had to give him some uh, nasal uh, medication as well and he's been pretty zonked uh, afterwards so much so that uh, he's having trouble walking and getting around and especially the stairs so when uh, he needs to go downstairs um, David has been carrying him up and down and whatnot and David even had to take a day off work the day after because I couldn't carry him but I ended up having to sort of pick him up and carry him into the car one day when he was going to the vets and he's 35 kilos so it's really heavy and I had to carry him up down um, four times you know so in and out here at home and at the vets because he still wasn't able to get out of the car but uh, you know he is getting better but um, he had a big fall down the stairs the other day he often misses a couple of steps and sort of splats on the ground which is really horrific to see but uh, this time he fell down the entire flight of stairs um, which was just like watching you know one of those sled runs um you know and it was just awful there wasn't anything I could do like quick enough to help him or save him and so he ended up like at the bottom of the stairs all splattered out 
Um, fortunately, he didn't hit his head and he was able to get up afterwards and walk around. But luckily, our new neighbours, uh, you know, he's an engineer and he's a welder. So we found um, some materials around the house so that we can make him uh, his own doggy elevator. So they've half made that up now and they were going to install it today, but it's been raining. Uh, so hopefully by tomorrow... Buddy will have his very own elevator to take him up and down. But, of course, we've got to get him used to all of that. And, you know, hopefully he doesn't uh, dislike being in the sort of box-like contraption, you know, to be lowered up and down. But seeing him fall down the stairs like that, it's just really horrific. And, uh, you know, if we can save him from that, that would be good. So I just hope he, he likes the whole thing and I uh, hope he enjoys it. We did manage to take him to the beach yesterday and he loves the water so he got super excited about going there but he still wasn't get, able to get out the car so David had to pick him up and carry him and put him down on the sand and uh, then he enjoyed it and he went out for a paddle so hopefully it's just the after effects of the seizure and the the strong medication that he's had and hopefully he'll be back to his normal self until the next episode i guess but you know one one of those days when he wasn't feeling well i um we netflixed and chilled so i watched that um woodstock 99 documentary on uh, tv now, I must be the only person on the planet that didn't know that there was a Woodstock in 1999. When I think of Woodstock, I think of the original one. But this Woodstock 99 that they uh, they did, that seems to have been an absolute disaster. I mean, it would have been all right to go and see lots of really good bands, but a mm, bit of a disaster for for a lot of the people that were involved there i won't spoil it for you in case you want to see it yourself but um we watched some other documentary um i can't remember what it was now so it mustn't have been very good but it was really nice to sit on the couch with buddy and just you know be there for him when he's not feeling the best and sorry he is still sitting here scratching his head and he's really not very good at it, to be honest. We've never had a dog that's very good at scratching themselves. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> so my colour along for September, which is just getting closer and closer by the minute, is Salvo September 2022. And that's based on the artwork of Grazia Salvo. And oh, I don't know about you guys, but I just love her heart. I don't know about you guys, but I just love her artwork. And please excuse these these wild beasts in my house at the moment. <laughs> I don't know why they're making so much noise when I want to talk to you guys. <laughs> but uh, And if I lock them out, uh, they'll make more noise trying to get back into the door. But anyway, um, Salvo September. I'm going to colour, I think, from my Wild Soul book. It's funny because when I bought that book, I actually didn't think that I would like it because I don't really like colouring in animals that much. I mean, all that fur and all that hair and, you know, but it's actually one of my favourite books. I, d I don't know about you guys if that ever happens that you think you won't like something and then you do. And I also think that I might have a hope of being able to finish it because there's only like, um, 40 pictures I think for memory and I've already done like five pictures so I might actually have a hope of finishing that book in my lifetime so that would be good so anyway it's color and story time so today I thought we would talk about working life and I know many of you have jobs and some of you are also employers where you employ people and I thought we would go way back in time and we go back to 1917 in fact in Australia. I'm going to tell you about a guy that had a really bad day at work and maybe uh, another story as well if we have time. So back in 1917 there was a man named Brown and he owned a lot of grazing land at a place called Cope Cope in uh, northern Victoria. 
And back then there were no motorbikes or quad bikes or the likes to get around large farming properties. And sometimes on those properties you might find yourself really far up far away from the farmhouse or the homestead and you might not be able to return during normal working hours or even for days and back then it was common to take your horse or either horse and buggy if you had to take materials and go to these remote parts of the land. So Mr. Brown, he employed a number of people, including a man named uh, Winter, to work on the land. And Winter had worked for him for about eight years as a general labourer. And as part of his pay, his employee, Winter, he was entitled to cook meat at his lunchtime meal, or to have a cooked meat lunch, meat-based lunch, and it's a physical work, so this was a actual requirement back then uh, for the employees on the farm. And this was a time before refrigeration, so ice boxes were often used. Uh, it wasn't like nowadays where we can pop something from the fridge to the microwave and get our lunch in minutes. Now, over this large property there were also a few other huts and outbuildings that could be used by staff and Winter's arrangement of working on this property and getting his lunch with that meat component on it that all worked pretty well until the 27th of December in 1917 and on that day Winter was sent by his boss to a remote part of the property to cut thistles And he was told to stay overnight in the abandoned hut on the property. Now, this hut actually wasn't a house. It was just basically mud brick walls and a fireplace. And the roof on it had actually been removed the previous year. So it was just like three walls and a chimney, a fireplace in the middle type thing. And people often used it when they were in that part of the property. So Winter was given a packed lunch by Mrs. Brown and it comprised some raw meat, some chops to cook and raw potatoes, bread and some sauce and also some tea. And she packed his lunch uh, for the meal because the cook for the farm was away and Brown needed to fulfill his obligations to Winter by providing cooked meat for his lunch. So he was also given a saucepan to cook the potatoes and he had his billy as everyone did on farming communities to make his tea. I know uh, when I lived on a farm you always had a a billy to make tea and I always had it when I used to do a lot of cross-country horse riding in remote areas and it was just a thing you know to make tea or damper. So Winter also tried to pack the large frying pan that Uh, the cook used to use when they were cooking in bulk for the shearers and he wanted that to cook his chops in but when Mr Brown seen that he questioned him about it and Winter told him he wanted it to cook the chops but Mr Brown insisted that instead he go to the hut and there was a frying pan already there he didn't need it so he took the pan away from him but Winter decided that mm, no It would be just far simpler to camp out where he was working and make a campfire to cook the meat on, um, given that the hut was actually a mile away from where he was working. And so he'd have to harness up the horse um, and it had a buggy attached, take that all away a mile, you know, undo all of that, cook the meat, get the horse and buggy ready again and then take it all back and Where he was working, there was a dam nearby so that the horse could be watered and a mile away there was no water source as well. So as he didn't have the frying pan, he decided that he would just make his own sort of grill out of a bit of fencing wire. You know what farmers are like, they're very adept at uh, creating things, so he got a bit of fencing wire, created his own grill, 
built a campfire, decided to camp out, and I think you know how this story is going to go <laughs> from here. So the campfire, of course, got out of control, and it ended up destroying land. Uh, not only Brown's land, but also the next-door neighbour's land, the adjoining land owned by Albert Bug. And he, of course, was not a happy little Vegemite, and he sued for damage to his property, claiming negligence. And he said that he was owed about a thousand odd pounds in damages and he launched his claim at the Supreme Court in Victoria. Now, he didn't sue Winter, who had lit the fire, but he sued Brown, who employed Winter. And the reasoning for that was Brown was liable for his employees' actions. So this is just a fancy pants term in law known as vicarious liability where employers are liable for the actions of their employees. Now, this is law, so nothing is ever black and white. So there are some exceptions, uh, including one of them is if the employee was engaged in something that wasn't authorised or actually legal. So the court had to decide if Winter's employer Brown was liable for the damage to the adjoining owner, as it was his employee who had lit the fire. Now, Bug claimed that the negligence of Winter in lighting that fire and failing to stop it from spreading had caused him this over £1,000 of damage. And of course, Brown, the employer, didn't feel he was responsible either. He told Winter to use the hut to cook the meat and he hadn't done what he was instructed to do. So the Supreme Court of Victoria found that Winter's lighting of the fire was negligent, but it wasn't within the scope of his employment, so something that he was employed to do. So therefore, Brown wouldn't be liable to pay Bug the £1,000 odd in damages. But the story didn't end there. Bug didn't accept that because obviously Brown would have more money than the employee Winter and, uh, you know, suing Winter is probably not going to get Mr. Bug the thousand odd pounds in damages that he believes he was owed. Uh, whereas suing Brown that had a number of allotments of land uh, would definitely be the better deal. So in order to do that, he needed to prove that Brown was liable for his employees' actions, despite this earlier decision from the court. So he appealed to the High Court of Australia, claiming that Brown permitted Winter to light the fire on his land, and therefore he's liable for the damage caused by the escape of fire through negligence. And he's liable for that even if his instructions were disobeyed. So from the evidence, it seems that the instruction to use the hut to cook the meat was just for the sake of convenience, and it wasn't instructions given in order to avoid any fires on the property or any outbreaks of fires or, or spread. So Winter had the right to cook the raw meat. Now, Bugs lawyers also argued that if that act of cooking that meat and lighting that fire caused the damage, it's incidental to his job or his employment, and therefore his employer is liable under this fancy pants term of vicarious liability. Now, of course, Brown argued that vicarious liability didn't apply because he certainly doesn't want to pay the thousand pounds. And specifically, as he'd not authorised the fire to be lit, he'd told Winter to use the hut, and Winter had disregarded his instructions. And so this is what's often referred to in law as an independent frolic, like someone goes off and does something independently on their own. But the High Court felt that this wasn't an independent frolic and they felt that what Winter had done was actually within the scope of his employment. So have a think about that for a minute. Yes. So he was provided, Winter was provided with meals by his employer to cook. And that's what he did when you break it down. 
that's what he did do. He he was part of his remuneration, remun, oh, part of his pay, because I can't say that today, was to be provided with cooked meat. And that was part of his deal. That's what he did. He cooked meat. And although he didn't do it in the place he was asked to, it wasn't enough that it was outside the scope of his employment. So the employer is actually liable for his acts, even if it was outside the authority that he granted. And this only stops if Winter or any employee does something that's so alien or foreign to the employment that it might as well be a stranger that does it. Now, of course, employers can help their own position by giving really clear instructions and prohibitions so that if those instructions were disobeyed, they would fall into this area of being remote and disconnected from the employer as being in a position of a stranger. For example, uh, one example often given is someone that's employed as a nurse and then they take over from a surgeon during an operation. That would be alien and outside the scope of authority. But what Winter did was he was entitled to cook meat. He was given permission to cook meat and to light a fire, one fire being in a chimney of a hut, which only had three sides and no roof, and one you know, his own campfire, but he was given permission to cook this meat on this particular parcel of land. And that's what he did. He didn't do it in the place he was asked to, but there was nothing in the evidence to suggest that he was told only to cook it in this hut because they were worried about fire or fire spreading, or they didn't have any water at hand in order to stop any fire from spreading or anything like that. That wasn't part of the consideration. If it had have been in those instructions, the results might have been different because then it might have been truly outside the scope of the authority, those exceptions that the court flagged. But in this case, there was nothing to suggest that. And he was given saucepans, uh, you know, to cook the potatoes. So it And the other thing is that they didn't really mention in the case, but, you know, every time you heat a bully billy up to cook, so every time you create, make a billy of tea on a farm, you're generally lighting a fire. I mean, I can't think of a time in my experience where you haven't had a fire that you would light in order to make that. So... It was just such a common occurrence, not only, you know, back in the olden days, but still nowadays. I mean, no one has, uh, well, they might have camping stoves and things like that now, but a lot of people just, you know, light up a little fire and have dirt nearby to put out the fire because this is Australia, (laughs) you know, things can go up pretty quick um, and have water at hand to toss the fire out, but you know, a lot of people working on big farms, that's what they do. They, you know, get a little billy and make up their own tea, cook up some damper and toast some marshmallows and, you know, sit down and relax and have that. So it's not really outside the scope of employment if you're working on a farming area. And that's what the court found. So He actually did what he was authorised to do. So a lot of people think of this case as winter lit a fire and it spread everywhere and how can it possibly be that this is part of his employment but it it wasn't in that context he lit a fire to cook his lunch as he was entitled and given permission to do it was just in the wrong place or in a place that his employer had asked him not to but he did anyway and that was still within his employment because there were no specific instructions forbidding him to do that for the reasons of uh, a fire being started or something like that so it's a super interesting case and it's always uh, the leading case on vicarious liability in commonwealth countries and especially in Australia because it happened here. But there's also been some other funny cases on vicarious liability over the years. Uh, 
I don't think that one was funny at all for the poor for the poor farmers but uh, there's one recently here in Queensland I don't think I'll tell you about it because it kind of makes me a bit queasy and I've got a weak stomach <laughs> but uh, there is a, a sort of funny one uh, that happened a few years ago now it's certainly not funny for the lady involved uh, but a few years ago there was a female government employee and in Australia and she went on an overnight work trip for her job and it was a country town that she ended up in she was doing some training courses there now her employer booked and paid for this budget motel for her to stay overnight and now during this overnight stay she went out for dinner with a friend that lived in that town now one thing led to another and they went back to the motel for a bit of horizontal folk dancing you know what i mean now the earth moved for the pair because a glass light fitting above the bed fell from its mount and it fell on the poor lady and it injured her nose and mouth and she ended up being hospital now as she was injured on this work trip she lodged a claim for workers compensation because after all she was only in this town for work and after some court battles the thing went up and down in the courts and all around the case found its way to the high court of australia and they had to decide if the injury she suffered was actually within the course of her employment or not so remember in the case that we talked about just a minute ago lighting the fire was within the course of the employment in this case the high court said she wasn't uh, engaged in any activity at the time of those injuries that were induced or encouraged by the employer the employer didn't tell her to go to the motel and have some hanky panky and you know these this is something that could happen so the court said that the mere fact that the employer paid for the motel and encouraged her to stay there didn't cause enough of a connection to the employment to impose any liability on the employer but uh, so in that case the employer wasn't vicariously liable at all for the damages but in this most recent case in Queensland that relates to workers that fly in and fly out and of accommodation these two workers ended up in Daydream Island and they were sort of bunked up in a share accommodation standard now I don't want to get into the details because it does make me a little bit queasy but one of the colleagues that one of the employees that was sharing a room that's paid for by this employer um, was a sleepwalker and during one of his sleepwalking episodes he ended up assaulting we'll put it like that his other colleague and that colleague ended up suffering some medical loss and damages and that one too uh, flitted its way around the courts for a bit but ultimately the court decided that the employer was liable uh, because they were the ones that had put the two employees together in this accommodation and if it wasn't for that then this other employee wouldn't have suffered a uh, the medical loss and damages that he did because of uh, his roommates sleepwalking um, so yeah different things and I mean there is a big difference between being asked to bunk up with somebody and share accommodation share employee accommodation than having a motel room to yourself so big difference there but yeah I thought they were interesting I don't know what you guys think um, I do feel sorry for the woman involved in the motel case I mean she was injured as well but um, the case it kind of always gets a bit of a smirk you know and it was kind of reported quite a lot in the media at the time a few years ago when it happened and uh, you know although it has she hasn't been uh, really named in the media it's still enough to sort of make you kind of embarrassed for her as well as her injuries and uh, 
this poor other guy that was injured in this recent case on Daydream Island. You kind of feel sorry for him because um, it's sort of queasy inducing what happened to him. Um, I won't go into the details because of my weak stomach, but anyway. Um, so I, I'm curious as to what you guys think, if you think that the judges got it right in all of those different little cases that we've briefly talked about today. Um, always like to know what you think and until next time stay safe and happy colouring. <laughs>